right, we're going to get started in a few minutes, so I'd like everybody to find their seats. the pin drop silence. Maybe I'll carry a microphone around all the time. Okay. So I'd like to remind everyone to kindly switch your mobile phones to silent mode and to limit the use of the auditorium doors to avoid interruptions. So good afternoon, welcome um, freshman gateway students. Um, I hope you're ready for an exciting round of presentations by our seniors. Uh, we have with us on our panel, Ms. Vicki Cornell, gateway mentor, Mr. Patrick Hancock, gateway mentor, Ms. Anne-Marie Van Sickle, Lincoln Park, director of curriculum and instruction, welcome. And to get us started, I'd like to invite Mr. Klebitz, our principal, to say a few words. Wow, that, that's really bright. <laughs> um, good afternoon and welcome uh, to the second half of our Gateway presentations. Um, was able to see a few this morning and they, they were wonderful. Um, great job to the seniors who have already gone and best of luck to the seniors who are getting ready to present here in a couple of minutes. Um, thank you to the, oh wow, that, that one's <laughs> even worse than that one. All right, um, parents, um, I know that there's, they're filtering in and out, so there's one set of parents here right now. Um, thank you for coming, uh, taking time out of your day to see your child present, and uh, thank you for your support over the last four years of the program. Um, students, so this is the final, right, the, the final hurdle that we have to get over for Gateway. Um, I know that it's been a lot of time and a lot of effort over the past four years, um, two years of which were learning on different platforms, which was extremely difficult. Um, and I'm sure that there might have been times where throughout the four years of Gateway, you, you were um, overwhelmed maybe with some work and the amount of responsibility and wanted to throw in the towel possibly a few times. I see some head nodding, but you stuck with it. Um, and you've, you've just, you've given phenomenal presentations today and it's only made you a much better uh, academic student. Again, you're going through this, this process. You may not realize it now, but the skills that you have learned in Gateway are definitely going to help you out at the next level. Um, learning how to complete work and tasks on a timely manner, uh, along with how much detail you need to put into it in order to improve um, and to receive a grade that, that you're happy with. And I know I'm talking right now to the seniors, but ninth graders, you're, they were you only a few years ago, right? So I'm speaking to you, so uh, everything that you're going to be going through over the next four years, our seniors have gone through. You've learned how to write and do research, which are skills that, again, are only gonna benefit you when you move on to that next level. Um, I know Mr. Pizzuto talked a little bit about his experiences, uh, educational experiences this morning and, um, you know, I started thinking too, I said that you know, we didn't have, in my high school, we didn't have a, a program like this. And I really, you know, thinking back, I always said I, I never really learned how to write until I got to college. My freshman year in college, I had a phenomenal professor. And, you know, when you go through high school, you can, you can write a great research paper, you can write a great paper, but 
you know, when you get to that next level, um, again, I, I didn't learn all of, a lot of these skills until my freshman year in college by reading some of the work that you guys put together. I know that you already have those skills. You've learned them here, and that's only going to benefit you and put you head and shoulders above some other students when you move on next year. Uh, and you've also learned how to present and public speak. It takes a lot to get up here and present in front of people. Um, it, it can be very nerve wracking at times. And we have a small crowd here today, but you know, again, it is, it's practice for you. And uh, from what I've seen today already, you're, you're doing a phenomenal job. So I remember when you walked in as ninth graders, right, four short years ago, um, I've watched you grow and mature um, over the years. Um, I'm excited to, when we invite our alumni back next year, I'm excited to see you, hopefully you come back and let us know how your experience is at college um, and how well you prepared you were and how when you speak with the Gateway students who are coming on up through, um, just how important the program is because it is a great program and we've, we've definitely had a lot of success throughout the years. So again, best of luck today. Congratulations on getting over this final hurdle and uh, can't wait to see the presentations. Mr. Clavitz. All right, here to get us started and to keep you on your proverbial toes is our first speaker of this afternoon, Massey Serenelli. This inspiring young woman is captain of the soccer, basketball, and track and field teams, participates in Peer Leadership Council and National Honor Society. Additionally, she is a member of the Bruton First Aid Squad. Mazzy will be attending Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania for track and field and has additionally been accepted into their pre-social work program. She hopes to earn a master's of social work and license and further apply for the US Army National Guard working in the Army Medical Department as an allied health professional. Ms. Serenelli will also be playing in a U.S. Women's National League soccer team for Morris Elite. Told you she does it all. Today she will walk you through her thesis paper and research on, on the psychological polarization of mental health. Ladies and gentlemen, Mazzy Serenelli. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So as Ms. Ball said, this is the psychological polarization of mental health, a society of extremes. Um, to start us off, I'm sure you all know what mental health is or have a rough definition in your mind of what mental health is. Formally, it's defined as being mentally and emotionally sound. This is characterized by the absence of mental illness and a comfort in yourself, your surroundings, your feelings, and everyday life demands. Which brings us to my thesis. While mental health is increasingly popular in social media nowadays, there are still negative stigmas and connotations that it carries. There, this leads us into three major issues. There's invalidation of high functioning forms of mental illnesses because those people aren't sick enough. There are labels, untrue stigmas, negative connotations placed on those with mental health, saying that they are weaker, that they're a burden, and that they're to blame for their issues. And there's a lack of seriousness and prioritism in these people, such as that it is less important as people with physical disabilities or physical disadvantages. Stigma is what is behind these three things. The first type of stigma is public stigma, which is negative or discriminatory attitudes from others. I'm sure you all can t think of an example of this stigma. It would be like somebody was telling you that you're not good enough, as if somebody was telling you that you are to blame for what goes on in your mind. Second kind of stigma comes from within you. 
It is self-stigma. It's negative attitudes that you tell and place upon yourself. It's, it comes out in many forms of self-invalidation, telling yourself you're not good enough, telling yourself you are to blame. The third kind is probably the least known kind of stigma, however it is just as popular, institutional stigma. It's very systemic. You can see it within healthcare systems, within workplace, and within opportunities. This would be as if a, a person who is mentally ill doesn't get as many opportunities or as high a pay as another person. There are many common false stereotypes about people with mental illness. The most common being that they are dangerous, that they're incompetent, that they're to blame, and they're, that they're unpredictable. These things don't just affect the person that they're being put upon, but they also affect society as a whole. When this is what is being taught to that person, that po person develops a lack of motivation to get better and a lack of understanding that they are okay with the way they are. This also affects society as a whole because it's now how everyone is going to perceive a person with a mental illness. When you're telling yourself that you're, that you're to blame for the way you are, society will also tell you you're the way to blame for the way you are, and it leads into a circle of stigmatism. There is a 70 to 90% unemployment rate for people with schizophrenic mental illnesses. Now, this is a higher rate than any other disadvantaged group in the workplace, including people who are physically impaired and cannot physically complete jobs. People with schizophrenic mental illnesses are also six to seven times more likely to be unemployed than any other person in the workforce. Second part of my thesis talks a lot about psychological polarization. Psychological referring to the mind and polarization being opposite sides to a situation in terms of standards, thoughts, and treatment. Basically what this is saying is that when we treat mental illness not as serious or in a different way than physical illness, people will also see it that way. So now mental illness will be perceived as a weakness, while physical illness is something that you can still overcome. As we can tell from this graph, since the 2008 to 2010 period, social media has been on the rise exponentially. And this graph only goes up to 2018, and we can only, I'm sure, imagine at how high it would be now in 2022. With the rise of social media, so many more people are being affected and influenced by these things. The things that influencers put out influence all of you in your everyday lives, whether you, you recognize it or not. This leads us to the cultivation theory and the social learning theory. These theories basically explain that what we see online transfers into our everyday lives. When somebody becomes so infatuated with what they see online every day and so infatuated with their online profile, that's exactly what they will project into real life too. So for example, if I'm obsessed with how I look online on Snapchat and I'm posting everything about my life to get my viewers on Snapchat to like me, that's what I'm going to be doing in real life and what I'm going to be thinking in real life rather than separating my online profile from my real life here. How that ties into my thesis, when online you're seeing comical images of people in mental health crises and seeing people portrayed as weaker for having to deal with something you might not deem as, as serious as a physical burden, in real life when I see somebody dealing with that, I might be like, oh, that's not as important, that's not serious, they should just get over it. When in reality, a, mental impairment is just as important and just as serious as a physical impairment. Um, two ways you guys might be able to see this. Um, the movie Split from 2016 and Joker in 2019 both portrays people with mental illnesses as violent or weak or burdens. Split is a movie about a violent kidnapper who kidnapped three girls and treated them in unhumane ways. The catch here, this kidnapper also has disassociative identity disorder. DID is a multiple personality disorder in which people have multiple distinct personalities with different characteristics of each personality. This marginalizes people who are already struggling on a daily basis with the weight of stigmas by creating a stigma that they are unlawful or violent or going to do something to harm you. Similarly, Joker, a movie about a guy who proceeds to go clinically insane after the absence of his antipsychotic drugs and go on a killing spree. This specifically targets people who are unmedicated with mental illness, also tying into self-stigma. Are you not sick enough to go on a mental illness and therefore shouldn't be feeling the way you feel? Or are you too sick that you have to go on medication to treat yourself and to just feel normal and okay? 
these things are all brought about with the portrayal of mental illness in medias and in mass productions. Um, a very important quote that I took from the movie Joker is this. What do you get when you cross a mentally ill loner with a society that abandons him and treats him like trash? You get what you deserve. This chart was taken from a study done in 2018 around the same time that Joker was produced in 2019. Um, it, is, it measures the amount that prejudice and stigmas are measured and the validity of those in studies. So basically what this chart tells you is that prejudice is a very multi-dimensional factor and it affects apathy and it affects a lots of emotions and not just prejudice. So prejudice comes from within you, but it is not just from what you're thinking in your mind, it's also how you're trained to feel about a certain situation. It also, this graph can also tell us from the results that are shown numerically that people that have lack of apathy, apathy towards people with mental illness will also discriminate them physically. So it won't just be you thinking that they're not the same as you or that you thinking that they're weaker, you'll also show that. You'll show that you think you're, they're weaker. You will treat them like they are lesser than you. There are, is only a 4.3% rate of crimes that are so associated with psychiatric disorders. So contradictingly to what is shown in the movie Split and Joker, there is, a, there is only 4.3% of crimes that have anything to do with anything surrounding mental illness. Everything else, people are, are deemed to be mentally sound and are completely capable of knowing what they are committing. This leads me into the final part. Recognition is not a solution. Just knowing about this will not solve anything because people will go about their days and continue the same thoughts they have about people. We cannot just recognize this fact, but we have to change. We have to teach our younger generations what is good, what is bad, and what is acceptable. We have to deem mental illness just as acceptable as physical illness is. It's just as important. Early education will improve this. Enforcing mentally enriching principles will help this. For example, you can make something such as asking people about their day or how they're feeling a dinner table conversation every night. You can ask your children how they're feeling and go into depth about their emotions and why they're feeling the way they are. Validation and comprehension is an improvement. Even if we may not understand or cannot apathize with people who have mental illness, you still need to be able to understand that they are going through something that is bigger than you and bigger than them. They are going through something that you may not be able to understand completely, but you need to know that it is just as important as if they broke their leg. Being open is an improvement. You need to be able to take this in and know that people are going through struggles that you don't know about. Even if you are mentally ill, there are people that are mentally ill that affects them differently. You need to take this all into consideration and not just recognize this, but institute this into your daily lives. Apathize to people that you may not know more about. The idea of a mentally ill individual still carries false stigmas and negative connotations because of the psychological polarization of mental illness in general. While this is increasingly normalized and increasingly talked about in recent medias, we still need to be open and we still need to teach others that it's not okay to have prejudice and stigmas against mental illness versus the prejudice and stigmas that, or the absence of prejudices and stigmas that are on physical illnesses. And I'll now be taking questions. Mazi, uh, before we take questions from the panel, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce the panel once again because we have some people join us. Um, so we have Miss Vicky Cornell, mentor for the Gateway Academy, Mr. Patrick, Patrick Hancock, also mentor for the Gateway Academy, Miss Anne Marie Van Sickle, Lincoln Park Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Miss Heidi Brady from John Hill School, guidance counselor for grades six through eight. Ms. Robin Schwab, Booten High School Mental Health Clinician, and Ms. Leah Birchler, Booten High School School Assistant Counselor. So happy you could all be here. And now, uh, questions from the panel.
question, first question I want to ask is, what is your thoughts about where students at Booton High School or students who are of ninth through 12th grade age are with stigma and mental health? Because it changes as society goes by, but what, what is the present state? Um, I think specifically in our community, in Bruton High School, I feel like it's a very open topic. I've heard multiple people have conversations about it. I've had conversations about it with people, and I don't think it's very stigmatized in our school specifically, but I think in high school in general, like reading things online, going through seeing memes online even, making jokes out of it and stuff like that, I think that needs to be talked about a lot more and it needs to be become a much more open thing where a lot more people are exposed to that kind of thing. And the other question I have is, how do you feel that the school system, because it's obviously different ages, can work to impact reducing the stigma when it comes to mental health issues? I feel like, um, again, specifically Booton High School wise, I know they were trying this year to implement mental health days or wellness Wednesdays, things like that. But I feel like specifically those days too, it was kind of here, go have free time, go watch a movie or here, go do this activity. It wasn't geared towards, let me teach you about mental health, let me have that conversation, and let me figure out what needs to be done to improve our school system specifically and improve our students' mental health. Do you think something like a committee of students at the high school working with an adult would be helpful? I think that could definitely improve things, yes. I think you did a great job, Thank and you. you're very poised and a lot of good research. Um, I'm curious to what you found to be the most surprising thing as you're researching the topic. Um, I think my topic personally, I knew a lot about just because seeing things online, and a lot of this has to do with social media, which is very prominent in my lives, and I think many lives of people here today. Um, I just think it was very interesting um, I'm very interested in law too, and so the, a lot of times there is like the plea for insanity. And I think it was very interesting to learn that only 4.3% of crimes actually have to do with mental illness, when in reality so many people might use that as kind of an escape method or getaway method to try and get a lesser sentence or get away with their crimes by pleading insanity and things like that. I wish I didn't have a less than 24 hour old example for this, but do you think part of the stigma comes from the m when the major events happen, right? Like yesterday's mm -hmm. events in Texas, one of, if not the biggest call is for mental health reform instead of anything else. How much do you feel like that contributes to the stigma that you researched? Um, I feel like in medias too, a lot more of the horrific and bad events are displayed rather than the good ones. So when something bad happens, such as the events of yesterday, it's all over the media and then it's like, well, does this child need mental health help? Does he have mental health issues? And then it's placing bad stigmas and a bad rep on mental health and mental illness and things like that. Whereas when there's good things like, um, for example, one of the big things was when Simone Biles, she reached out about her mental health and I think that was portrayed in such a light that it was like, oh, somebody finally reached out. But she's not the first athlete to reach out about mental health, and we don't see stories like that a lot. We don't see the good, we always see the bad, and I think that is what also creates stigma, is because we're seeing all the bad things and the horrific things having to do with it, rather also the improvements and the good things. So first of all, great job, you did so good. Thank um, you. So I just, what do you think that the older generation could do to, like what do you think our, the younger generation should do to teach the older generation or maybe like make them more understanding about mental health like and how would that affect our society and maybe like bring some more change? Um, I think there just, there needs to be more openness as a whole. So obviously as a younger generation, we're a lot more enlightened to this. Older generations, mental health was kind of a hush topic 
and something you didn't really talk about because, again, it wasn't treated as important or as seriously. So I think it has to just be more open conversations, more, more teaching them about it because they weren't really exposed to it in the way we were. So are they really to blame for not knowing as much or for not being as open about it when they haven't learned as much about it? Thank you, Zara. Any more questions from the audience? Hi, Marzi. It's Ava. Hi, Ava. Um, awesome job. You're Thank very you. confident. I love it. Um, I wanted to ask you if you notice anything with like TikTok trends, because I know that for a while on TikTok, it was kind of like a trend to for people to pretend that they have DID or pretend that they have Tourette's and stuff. Do you think that that is damaging for people that actually do deal with those mental problems? Um, I think I, it definitely is damaging, and then people will always bring up the argument that, oh, people cope in different ways, maybe making jokes about it is a coping method. But I think when you're, when you're putting out discriminatory things and when you're putting up things that directly make fun of people who have actual psychiatric disorders, when you do not personally suffer from that disorder, I think that's definitely damaging because you could be putting a different image, a bad rep on those people who are actually suffering from it in their everyday lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Any questions from our center stage freshman gateway students? No? All right, thank you very much, Mazzy. Thank you. After that amazing performance by Mazzy, we now have Manar Bakar, who, having played field hockey for seven consecutive years, cites one of her greatest accomplishments as scoring and beating both the Quanic and Madison multiple times during her senior season and ultimately winning the 2021 conference championship title. In her free time, Manar enjoys watching movies, working out, reading books, and spending time with her family and friends. She also loves spending time with animals and volunteering at animal clinics or farms. Manar will be studying biology as an undergraduate at Montclair State University and eventually attending veterinary school. The topic of Manar's thesis this afternoon is the effect of sleep routines and eating habits on, adoles on an ad adolescence. Give it up for Manar, please. So my thesis paper and presentation is on the effects of sleeping routines and eating habits um, on mainly students. Um, I focus on teenagers and college students. So by a show of hands, let's try and be honest here, um, how many of you guys had about eight to 10 hours of sleep last night? All right, and how many of you guys either skipped breakfast this morning, lunch this morning, or dinner last night? All right, 
and how many of you guys either this morning, sometime today, or within the past few days had a cup of coffee, tea, or an energy drink, like a bang, a monster, Celsius? All right, there you go. All right, so why did I choose um, this topic out of the billion topics that I could have chosen? Um, I didn't just want to choose any old topic to do my presentation on. I wanted to choose something that I would be able to learn about and research and hopefully apply to my life in the future to try to better my life and hopefully teach you guys a little something too. So we're human, right? Our lives are fast paced, they're stressful, it's busy, it's crazy. Sometimes it feels like we're running behind on things. We're constantly trying to get things done. Um, trying to focus on the present and live in the moment, but learn from our mistakes in the past, but also prepare ourselves for the future. This can cause fatigue, a lack of motivation, a lack of confidence, the inability to focus, the inability to concentrate, and also the inability to control our moods. Fortunately, there are ways to help with these feelings, um, to help decrease them, such as focusing on establishing a consistent sleeping schedule, um, maintaining eating habits to our best abilities, and developing healthy habits. Um, while I was researching, one of the things that I didn't really ever think of when I came across um, eating and diets and whatnot was finding, affording, and actually following a diet that is reasonable for each individual. Some people have allergies, some people have religions or faiths that tend to shun certain foods or certain meats out. Um, some people have certain diseases where they can't eat certain things or they have to eat certain things. Um, and the other thing is, of course, maintaining a sleep schedule, which is the second half of uh, my thesis paper. It's hard. We, we sleep, most of us, with who sleeps with their phones in their rooms or stays on their phones a little bit before they go to bed. It's hard, it's the 21st century, we're all guilty of it. Um, but my presentation hopefully will help you guys learn a little something. Okay, so we're gonna start with eating habits and diets, um, specifically the struggles of eating disorders in students. Um, it affects more than just our physical bodies. Uh, people think that eating disorders affects the way you look, affects your organs, affects your digestive system, but it's a lot more than just that. Grades begin to slip, students can't concentrate in class, students lose interest in hobbies that they once found joy in, such as sports, extracurricular activities, clubs, hanging out with friends, and they tend to become more emotional as well. Um, students may also skip class, they might be tardy, they might not just feel like showing up to class anymore, um, asked to leave, want to get sent home, call mom and dad, hey, um, I'm gonna pretend I'm sick, can you pick me up from school? Um, and also, isolating themselves. Some people with um, eating disorders, students specifically, teenagers as well, um, tend to want to hide their disabil their, dis <laughs> their disorders from their loved ones, skipping out on parties or dinners, um, so that they don't have to deal with comments on, oh, why are you eating that? Why aren't you eating this much? Why, why are you eating too much? Um, it might seem like not that big of an issue, right? 90% of high schoolers do end up graduating in the United States. So it's like, hey, why is this a problem? Students are graduating, they're doing fine, they're going off to college. In the moment, it might not seem like such a big deal, but later on in the long run, there are multiple um, harmful consequences such as heart disease, kidney problems, liver problem, problems, osteoporosis, which is a disease with like fragile bones, um, and death in extreme situations. So anorexia is one um, extreme situation that some um, teenagers and patients unfortunately may pass away from. Um, this is a quote from an article that I found, uh, centerforchange.com, and um, a doctor named Paul Harper did some anonymous research on college students that have disorders, and he s took one college freshman's report and 
the anonymous student talked about how he or she uh, dealt with their anorexia throughout college, and they spoke about how education no, really, no longer really mattered to them anymore. They were too busy trying to take care of themselves and fix what they felt was wrong about themselves. They started to lose connections or relationships with their loved ones because they were so consumed by their eating disorder. Um, college is rough. High school is rough. We're about to enter college in just a few months, most of us. You guys in a few years. It's hard. I grew up with older siblings. They're constantly in a state of stress. I mean, we're high schoolers, and we pretty much just seem to, fi seem to feel the same way as well. You're trying to figure out who you are, what your purpose is, what your morals are, trying to establish friendships and relationships and keep them. Having an eating disorder just makes life that much harder. So the effects that healthy foods have on mental health, so these are some, like, solutions um, or ways that could help. Um, strengthen your diet and your eating habits. So vitamins and nutrients that can positively affect um, someone's ability to focus their energy levels and um, their moods. So the two uh, big ones that I found are amino, certain amino acids and omega-3 fatty acids. Um, omega-3 fatty acids enhances serotonin and dopamine, which are important chemicals in your uh, brain that make you feel happy, make you feel good. Um, they can be found in walnuts, sp specifically most types of fish, like salmon, anchovies, and seeds as well. So like chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds. Um, amino acids such as tyro tyrosine and tryptophan, tryptophan, yeah, tryptophan um, are in charge of building dopamine, which is that lovely chemical that um, makes us feel good. Um, and it helps also fight stress and anxiety. So that pretty much means that if you eat certain foods with these amino acids or um, with omega th omega-3, it could potentially help you fight off those horrible feelings that you might feel. Anxiety, stressing, worrying, potentially mentally, dis men mentally Ill mental illnesses as well, such as ADHD or ADD. Um, and those amino acids can be found in fruits, vegetables, eggs, and fish. So sleeping patterns and concerns. Um, the CDC estimates that 57% of middle schoolers um, and 72% of high schoolers fall below the average estimated recommended time um, that you should sleep every night. We saw in the beginning of my presentation, pretty much all of you <laughs> did not get the recommended amount for um, people over the age of 12, um, which is eight to 10 hours. Students or children that are six to 12 years old are recommended about nine to 11 hours. I have a little brother and he does not get that much either. Do you guys have younger siblings that you see maybe staying up on their iPads and devices and don't get that much sleep and then have to wake up for school the next morning? It's hard. Um, social media is one of those lovely things that kind of has taken over our generations. But um, the National Sleep Foundation's 2014 Sleep in America poll reported that 89% of s teenagers uh, sleep with their phones. We talked about this in the beginning of my presentation as well. Um, phones have blue light, which very, very negatively affects um, the human brain and eyesight. It keeps our brain going for a lot longer. That's why it might be harder to sleep once you put your phone down and you can't, you're like, come on, sleep, sleep, and you can't because those blue lights are affecting your eyes and your brain. Um, taking naps, I know sometimes you might stay up really late doing homework or studying for that exam and you sleep really late, you wake up in the morning, you come home from school and you wanna take a nap. Now you might think that taking a nap and catching up on sleep is a great idea, right? It feels great, but it's actually harmful because it disrupts your homostatic system, your biological sleep patterns, which I'll talk about in the next slide. It also, Bad, inconsistent sleep patterns also um, affect memory, so it's harder to recall details, it's harder to just communicate with people, it's harder to make good decisions, um, and it also tends to lead to mood swings. So bursting out in anger or frustration when things aren't working out, when you make a little mistake, when you stub your foot on a bed, you'll, you'll freak out because if you're falling back on sleep, it's your body's reaction to do that 
um, isolation, locking yourself up in your room, not wanting to talk to people, not wanting to go out and hang out with friends. Um, yeah. So a research study that I found done on the benefits of delayed school start times is actually really interesting. Um, it was published in April 2020 by the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Basically, they spoke about what I talked about before, um, that our school starting times are so early that it disrupts um, children's, sorry, biological um, and homostatic systems. Um, uh, so the results from the study showed that they pushed school a little bit later for students and they t gathered a bunch of data from all the schools and it showed increased attention levels, better moods, fewer symptoms of depression. Students were less dependent on caffeine, so all you guys that were drinking, you know, caffeine and whatnot. Starting school later might help you with, with um, some of those uh, issues. Uh, better attendance, so less students showed up late, more students showed up on time, more students were engaged in their class, overall better um, performance in academics. I know it's a huge controversial and difficult change to make. I mean, it's not that easy to just push all schools an hour later. Um, it would change school bus times. It would change, it would affect parents' uh, work schedules. It's not easy, and I understand that. Um, but the impacts that this change could potentially make um, would solve a lot of problems that we have in modern school systems. We are, us, all of us sitting in these chairs, we are our world's future, we're our future lawyers, we're our future doctors, our future engineers. Um, we are our future. So starting now, when we're young, when we're students, and trying to solve these problems to make us healthier, to, help, to, to make us more engaged in school, could potentially lead to brighter futures. Um, time management and self-discipline. So once again, our lifestyle as in our modern generation we're busy, like I said. Life is fast, things are always changing. Sometimes it's really hard to catch up on. Um, Unbalanced sleep schedules due to work, jobs. I know some students are interning. I'm one of them, it's hard. I come home and I take like three hour naps and then I have to wake up and go to my second job. It's hard. Um, some of you guys are parents, you have children to look after. Some of you guys have responsibilities, chores, whatever it is, it's hard. Sometimes you forget meals forget to eat, you skip meals because you're so busy studying um, or writing that paper that you've procrastinated for a month that you forget to eat dinner and you go to bed and you wake up the next morning. But time management and self-discipline are key. Setting reminders. Um, I think in Andrew's presentation, um, that great thing on, I think it's iPhones, screen time. You can check how long you're on your phone. You can set alarms on TikTok and Snapchat and YouTube even, Netflix, to turn the device off um, when you've reached a certain amount of time. Making time to eat, your plant, to eat your meals and setting goals and meal prepping. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, but you can start small by, you know, grabbing a fruit when you walk out the door instead of grabbing a stale donut that's been sitting there for, for days. Or putting your phone down 30 minutes earlier to get 30 more minutes of sleep instead of scrolling through TikTok meaninglessly, not even remembering what the last video was. Um, and of course, prioritizing your health and well-being. First, you have to know that there's an issue. You have to know that, hey, I should fix my sleep, I should fix my eating habits, and then you can do something about it. Um, and also, one other thing that I took away from my research is that there is a time and a place to worry about things. Um, there's also help that you can seek, of course, therapists, counselors, um, talking to parents and even just friends or family you can get help for all the things that you're stressing about, that you're worrying about. You can also, there's um, professionals that can help you with your eating habits, like nutritionists, doctors, there's professionals, there's people there to help you, you're not alone. And my conclusion, so my main hope and objective of my present presentation was just to educate myself mainly, but of course you guys too. Um, after doing tons and tons of research, I just wanted to bring awareness to, for myself and for you guys to the issue. Um, I wanted to, to understand the true importance of eating right and sleeping well. Um, these are the very few steps of change. Once again, 
we are our future. So the healthier we are, the more motivated th we are, the better we eat and the more we sleep, the better people that we are. And the future lies in our hands. And the, the healthier that we are and the better people that we are, the f brighter our future will be. Thank you, Manara. That was a brilliant presentation. We will take questions from the panel now. Manara, thanks. That was that was all really great advice. I loved how your your research was so in depth, yet you had a lot of really relatable tips for all of these things. Um, I'm wondering if you looked at or considered or researched how people can can follow this advice. Right, we all. I, I feel like we all. It sounds great. We want to follow it, but how to stay consistent so that it's effective, and how to know if it's effective. The one. I think the three main things that I mentioned in my slides was that there is help. I feel like I'm myself. I'm someone that struggles with sleep. I actually pulled an all-nighter last night, and I didn't <laughs> eat breakfast this morning, and I have like a gallon of coffee sitting there. But I'm trying. That's. <laughs> I mean, it's, we're human, um, but I am trying. I don't think it's about being perfect. I don't think it's about fixing all your problems overnight. I don't think it's about doing a bunch of research and then wanting to change instantly. I wish life was that way. I wish it was that quick. I wish it was that easy, but it's not. So I think that starting small and having a support system is the most important thing. Talking to your friends, talking to your family, seeking professional help, doing your own research about diets and about um, what fits your busy life and your schedule yourself, I think that's the most important thing. I know it's hard and it is very time consuming, but I think that starting small and educating yourself first and then having that support system are the first few steps that could really make a big change in your life. Yeah, so being aware and then, and then being forgiving. And being exactly, aware. and being patient. <laughs> if you need a coffee, drink the coffee. <laughs> Other questions from the panel? Um, hi, Manara. I have a question. You did a great job. Um, so I'm really interested in the research that you did about the study on starting school later. Mm -hmm. um, can you just tell a little bit more about what you read? Like, did, was there a suggested start time and how that aligns with our body's natural rhythms? Um, because I know I've done some reading on that myself about yeah. teenagers and when they really should be starting their day. Yeah, I wish there was more research and studies on this. I wish I could have conducted one myself and like just pushed an hour later for school and then just <laughs> took data on how happy you guys are and how well you guys are doing or the opposite. But um, there isn't much because it is a lot harder than it seems. Of course, like I said, bus schedules, parents schedules, teachers coming in that have to commute from different towns or different states. It's harder, but what I gathered from the, um, the, the study was that I think they, on they only pushed it till 8.30 for one of the schools and the other school was just eight o'clock. And it was a school of like 500, 600 people. Um, both of them were around the same, so like our school pretty much. And um, like I said, they had fewer symptoms of depression is what they claimed and less of them were caffeine dependent, which would be amazing for me. I would love that. Mm -hmm. um, most of them were more attentive in their classes. They wanted to learn. They were more engaged. They didn't skip classes. They came on time. Um, and I think, I mean, it kind of seems impossible, but if you just think for a second, if like every single student or a majority of students were like that, how much more we could do, like how much better our schools could be if everyone was engaged if everyone was well, well rested. And the other beautiful thing about pushing school later is that it gives us more time to sleep and to eat breakfast, which I would love. Like if I had an extra hour every morning, I would love to be able to just sit for a little bit and relax and to actually make myself breakfast and eat it. So I think pushing school later would be an amazing thing. But of course, it's a lot harder than we hope. I do just have a follow-up to that, though, because mm -hmm. I've thought about this, and I wonder what your thoughts are on if we were to start later, would we all just stay up later? Like, do you have any thoughts on that? Because I know even point. for me in the summer, mm -hmm. I get on a much later schedule because I don't have to be here at 7.30. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I see it the same way with our delayed openings. Like when we come in at like 9.30 um, up to like 2 a.m. doing homework. So there are pros and cons, but um, I, think, I think the better solution, well, for me, what I personally think, is just shortening the school day, which I know I'm saying just shorten the school day. Cubbies is looking at me like, what? But um, I think pushing it later on so we're able to sleep more and able to actually eat and whatnot, and then being able to end a little earlier would be ideal. But once again, this is like such a big issue that like it's kind of all talk and it's harder to actually do something about. But I think you bring up a good point with um, if we start later, then we'll probably end later, and then we'll stay up even later. So they're definitely all pros and cons, and there's a lot of research to be done and a lot to change, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I just was gonna, uh, maybe a comment, but also a question, but it, on to what Ms. Birchall was saying, is that I'm thinking to myself, like from talking to students here about what goes on in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. and you know, students telling me about, you know, being on their phones till three o'clock in the morning and not going to bed till four in the morning and, mm -hmm. you know, having group chats and doing all of these kinds of things. And like, do you think without, even if we were to change the school time in some way, mm -hmm. you know, in the state, that without the change, whether at home, whether it's the parents making the change or the yeah. students and, you know, the, not the blue light like you talked about, you know, would we be just staying in the same place without making a change on the other end? I think that change is a lot more difficult than most of us hope. I think that change starts, like you said, within the school systems, mm -hmm. but also within ourselves and our parents and our families who support us as well. So I think that, yes, pushing school later on, having shorter school times or whatever it is um, would help. But, of course, if you're still staying up on your phone, if you're still not eating, if you're taking that extra hour to just sit on TikTok or sit on Snapchat or watch an episode of whatever it is instead of actually eating or actually catching up on sleep, there is going to be no progress. But I think that opening up opportunities and having conversations about these things is what's going to kick, it's going to trigger a change. It's going to open up conversations and people to actually get educated on the topic. So to answer your question, no, of course, starting time, it, starting school later on isn't going to just solve all of our problems. But I think it will trigger a change um, within the school system. Thank so. you very much. Thank you, panel, for your questions. Um, I now pose questions to the, I, I would like to invite the audience to ask questions. Anyone from the audience? Hi, my name is Batiste. Um, what would you say are some of the really cool statistics you found through your study with the sleep schedule or eating or any of the topics? Um, well, most of the information about like um, students sleeping with their, with, or being on their phones before going to bed, um, it was like, I think 89% and 57% of middle schoolers and 91 or 89% of um, high schoolers um, fall below the average recommended amount of sleep every night. I think those have kind of brought no shock to me because I am a teenager and I deal with the same issues, so I kind of assume that's what the statistics would be. But to answer your question, the most like surprising statistic that I found was probably the um, research study done on pushing school later on because I didn't, I never really thought about that because it seems it is a lot harder of a change than, you know, I wish I could just snap my fingers and it would happen, but it would caused so many problems and it's a lot harder, but I think that whole study was the most shocking and surprising and honestly the more, the most like informing um, piece of research that I found for my paper, um, students reporting that they didn't need to even drink coffee anymore or that they didn't feel the need to be late to school or they were more attentive in their classes. Those were just all the statistics that I found that I found the most interesting because it's crazy to see a change um, like that within our school system. And it's like honestly a beautiful thing, but I think that was the most like interesting and shocking um, statistics that I found. But yeah. You 
can state your name and then the question. Hello, my name is Peter. I'm just wondering what do you think the school could do once wise in order to help with diet? Because as we know, I believe school lunch isn't very healthy. For personally, I'm on a low sodium diet and I can't have a school lunch. What do you think the school could do to improve diets? How do you think they could help school lunch wise? Well, Peter, I think that's a great question because I'm right on board with you. I think that our school lunches, I know now um, they've been free to all students with meals, which I think is amazing because m some students would just not bring a, a lunch to school. They couldn't afford one or they didn't have time to make one. But now I think it's great that it's open to everyone. But um, I think that having more options for students. Um, I went vegan for about a year. Oh, no, it was way less than a year. It was like six or seven months. <laughs> Um, sophomore year and I came to school and I just wouldn't eat because nothing was vegan here and I was too tired the night before or the morning of to make myself food so I think um, you said you have like a low sodium diet or people that are gluten free I think having more options um, would help students be able to eat and feel comfortable and knowing hey I'm gonna go to school and I'm gonna eat and I'm gonna be okay and I'm gonna have energy to get through the rest of my classes um, I think that would be beneficial for a lot of students. Great. Thank you so much, Manara. Our next Gateway Scholar, Ava Oberlin, has been involved with Boonton's cross country team, track team, SRA, student council, and the National Honor Society throughout her high school career. Ava's interests include reading, and one of her favorite books, and mine, is The Alchemist. She enjoys singing in Mr. Haddad's concert choir class and running, whether it is with Mr. Hancock and the cross country team or on her own. Ava plans on studying psychology in college, and today she will be discussing the effect of extracurricular activities on success. Ava Oberlin, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Ball. Um, so yes, I'm Ava Oberlin, and I'm presenting on the positive effects of extracurricular activities on success. So to start off, I have a question for you. How do you define success or successful people? Okay, genuine happiness. Anyone else? Okay, well, we'll go with that one. Oh. Okay, yes, exactly. Living a life that you envision for yourself, something, living a life where you're happy, where you're waking up happy, you don't feel like you're dreading every day. So I agree. So now that we have a definition for that, um, I would like to see how extracurriculars relate to living that successful, happy life. So in the next slide, we have some resumes. Who's getting hired and why? On the one to the left, we have, um, her name is Jean. This was just a resume that I found online. But in her extracurricular activities, she has that she's a member of the chess club, debate team, and that she even helped with children that were refugees. Um, what a great loaded resume. And then over here we have, I have a bachelor's degree, give job. So the person with more experience is going to get the job 100% of the time. Having a degree does not guarantee you anything, 
which is why extracurriculars are so important because they can give you that life experience. And so you can explore um, the different things that you enjoy and it helps you build character. So I wanted to take a look at the social aspects first and then we'll get to academic aspects and then research from across the board. The social aspects to extracurricular activities is that students who perform well in extracurriculars are often performing better in the classroom. We have um, that they have higher self-esteem, there's lower rates of depression and anxiety, and lower rates of self-harm because students have a support system. When you're in an environment that you feel welcomed in, you're more likely to reach out to others and show more attributes of being open. On the graph over here, there was a study done at the University of Missouri, or University in Missouri, sorry, um, where they show the attributes of people who partake in extracurricular activities, and they show more attributes of friendliness and openness as opposed to being quiet and shy. Because students are in an environment where they're able to relate to others because they have a common interest, which is the extracurricular that they're partaking in, they are more likely to branch out to others in other aspects of their lives. It creates a well-rounded character and it's something, extracurriculars are something that are especially good for minority youth. In my research, um, I found an account of a student who moved from his predominantly black neighborhood to a white neighborhood in the South in Virginia. And in the school, he felt out of place at first, but then once he joined the track team, he met people that not only looked more like him, but he was able to connect better through doing the sport. Um, and I also want to mention that here in Bowen High School, we have groups such as the Muslim Student Association, Mr. Hancock, um, where students that practice Islam are able to connect with one another. I think that's a great way for youth to connect. Um, we also have groups like the Spanish Club where students of Hispanic backgrounds can connect to one another based on their shared culture. And so that's another positive aspect to extracurricular. Next, the academic as aspect. Um, not only in numbers such as GPA, but measured in overall happiness and rates of opportunity, the students are more successful. 70% of CEOs have been part of an extracurricular activity, and there's a 70% higher employment rate for people that participate in extracurriculars. Because they are, again, creating that well-rounded character for themselves, gaining more experience, they are able to network better, find people that will give them the opportunities for a job. Um, 40% of students involved in extracurricular activities are more likely to stay in school because they have that social aspect where they're able to connect to their peers. They feel like they have a purpose in the school system, which decreases the rates in dropping out. And there's time management and study habits. So something with extra extracurriculars is that um, I know here in Boone High School, for a lot of them, you need to maintain a C average or more in order to stay in a club or activity. So that's an incentive for people to do well in school. Next, we have research across the board. Um, when I was conducting my research, I did it on a global scale, so not just in the United States. So for preschool, um, there was a study done in Hong Kong in a preschool with kids that were involved in an artistic program in, in their school, and those students actually performed better academically. Even though the extracurricular was with art, they were able to connect more in their preschool. In, in middle school and high school, extracurriculars are used more for finding your interest of what you like and connecting with your peers, and then in college, they're a great way to build your resume to get a job. Students who perform better in extracurriculars when they're younger often have a higher growth 
trajectory than those who don't and higher reading and math levels. In the aspects of race, ethnicity, and nationality, students are able to find more people that relate to them and they can connect with others that relate to their experiences. And in socioeconomic backgrounds, extracurriculars can be used as a way of aftercare, especially for younger students. Some parents don't have the financial resources to send their kids to an aftercare program or to send their kids to a daycare. So putting them in a sport after school might be more beneficial because they don't have the economic resources to send their kids to aftercare. So in my survey at Boonton High School, 68% um, of students answered to the survey where the question was, do you think that extracurricular participation positively affects social communication? 68% of students agreed that yes, it is a positive aspect socially. And 61% of students indicated that extracurriculars are positively affecting mental health. However, there was a neutral split when asked about stress levels and extracurriculars. So based on that finding, I think that the reason why it was neutral is because students don't know how to manage properly their time management, like their time management skills. And extracurriculars, I think, are just another way that a student can work on those skills. So it's providing the opportunity for the student. The main takeaways are that extracurriculars add to success by creating a well-rounded person. A person who does extracurriculars has more experience in interpersonal relationships and more success in studying and academics. And students who perform well in extracurricular activities have a higher chance of growth throughout life. Thank you for listening and I will take any questions. Thank you, Ava, for that very interesting topic. Uh, questions from our panel? Great job, Ava. Thank um, you. So I have, I have two questions. Um, the first is since you have some, some dull-eyed ninth graders here who maybe are just kind of getting used still to the high school regimen and everything, uh, as someone who's uh, graduating, what is your suggestion to them? Do you have any extracurricular suggestions or suggestions for the ninth graders in this room? Um, cross country. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, um, Thank you. <laughs> definitely um, branch out to see what you like. Um, I know that I think in my freshman year, they still had like the debate team. And I went to one meeting and I absolutely did not like it at all. So. <laughs> Um, it's a great way, especially when you're in high school, to find out what you like and what you don't like. So I would say when you're a freshman, it's really important to start out freshman and sophomore year to see the things that you enjoy because who knows, maybe if you join like a math club, you might enjoy pursuing that and then want to go through getting a math degree in college or something like that, all starting from because you join an extracurricular. So start with your interests, see what you like and what you don't. Thank you. Uh, and I do have a second question. So for us at a small school, uh, we tend to run into the problem where certain students want to do everything but simply can't. Mm -hmm. Do you have a suggestion as to how small schools can tackle this cohort of individuals who wants to do everything but simply did it all happen at the same time or whatever the case is? Do you have a suggestion mm -hmm. for a school like ours? I would go to Patisse on that one. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> just kidding. But um, I would say for small schools, um, it is difficult because small schools definitely don't have um, the financial resources that a bigger school does. So to make things more accessible, I guess would to work out a schedule um, that's also more of an individual thing, I feel like, to make priorities. If there's one club where you really, you know, are interested in it, but it's not a, a passion, um, don't spread yourself too thin and prioritize what you need to. And I guess also for the coordinators of different clubs, maybe they can work out a schedule with one another. 
Thank you. <laughs> I think you did a great job. Thank um, you. Did you find any information on possible negative impacts of being involved in too many extracurriculars? Kind of piggyback onto that question. Yeah, it definitely, being involved in too much creates stress and it does create stress and anxiety because um, I know some people want to be there for everyone and everything, but it's just not possible. So um, relating to the other presentations, having um, the mental health resources as well can, part can in be involved also with the extracurriculars. Um, just making sure that your mental health comes first and extracurricular second, I guess. Any questions from the audience? Dita? I have two questions. Do you okay. think that this school has enough extracurriculars? Do you think we have too few, especially right now? And my second question is, do you think that the people in extracurriculars get enough recognition? For example, CSA, the architecture team plays fourth place of 15, and I have not heard anything, no announcements, no nothing about this. What is your opinion on this? Okay. Um. Going back, the first question, what was the first question again? Was, was that? Yeah. Oh, that there two, are two, enough yeah. extracurriculars. Um, I think that, I think that there are enough and if students feel like there aren't enough, I know that they will use their voice and say something. For example, I know that Sia, she just presented earlier this morning, was trying to create a club called JSA, which would, um, which is more like a political based club. But I think she had the feeling that sh there wasn't enough representation for political clubs. And so she went to go create her own. So I think our administration especially is very um, open to new clubs and new ideas. Um, it's just the students that need to create them. So I do think we have enough. Um, and about recognition, I definitely feel you. Cross country um, is not a very recognized sport in the school, but it's really what you make out of it. I know that every day in the morning announcements, Mr. Foreman will try to include everyone and in everything. Um, if you just send him an email, I'm sure that he will include CSA in the announcements for sure. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's also up to the students to create that recognition. I know with SRA, a lot of times we had to make our own posters around the school, advertising for our events and advertising for SRA as a club. Um, so to create more awareness, the club can work on it itself, but also definitely reach out to people with higher power like Mr. Foreman <laughs> who can announce about TSA. Congrats, by the way. <laughs> Good job, Ava. Thanks. But um, I had a question about, um, Menard just presented about how like school time would run later. Like that's just a, like an idea. But how do you think that would affect um, students taking extracurriculars like after school? That's a great question. It sounds very familiar. Um, I think that that can um, very much affect extracurricular activities because if school is ending at a later time, say if school is ending around four o'clock and if practice runs like an hour after school, then like Renar said, there is no time to eat or time to sleep. Um, so I think that that would be something that has to be worked out in the future. I'm not really sure how that would play out, but we'll see if it becomes a reality. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? All right, great job, Ava, thank you.
Next up is Joseph Lupera. Joseph plans to attend William Patterson University in the fall to pursue an undergraduate degree in business administration. An accomplishment that he is especially proud of is scoring 680 on his math SATs in March 2021, which was higher than roughly 93% of all other test takers. Another personal achievement that he is proud of is working as a waiter at Cedar Crest, a retirement community in Pompton Plains, for one year in January of 2022. You won't therefore be surprised at his choice of thesis statement, thesis paper, as he shares his research on the benefits and drawbacks of entering the labor force at an early age. Joseph Lepera, everyone. All right, so just a quick little anecdote about me. Um, as Ms. Ball mentioned, I have been working at a retirement community for the past year or so, and it didn't take long to notice that my life began to change, not just because of all the friends that I made, but because I was experiencing a lot of benefits that are, are gonna help me for the real world and when I go to college next year. So that actually got me wondering, would other people experience the same benefits if they applied for a job? And especially since this, it was a thesis season when I was thinking of that, I decided that that was what I would spend my year researching on. So first I wanna provide just a little bit of context in terms of the benefits that students tend to experience. Uh, first we have a study from Dora Gacheva at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. In her study, she created a computer simulation which simulates an actual labor force with actual workers and real world conditions. And what she ended up discovering in her study was that for every five hours worked per week, it yields a 1% increase in future wages. Next up, we have uh, a publication from Jalen Mortimer, whose work is actually featured in a, in a wide range of publications from the National Institutes of Health. And in his study, he also talked about the benefits of working as a teenager, but specifically, she emphasized a lot of the skills that many students tend to learn, such as time management, managing your money, and communication with others, which I will mention in my survey, but more on that later. And finally, we have uh, a study from the National Consumer League, which emphasizes the importance of how many hours is too much. Now, obviously, if you worked longer than, say, 20 hours, your grades would suffer because no one can manage that much stress, but it is actually a, a much more serious issue than that. Uh, obviously, if you're working that long, your grades would suffer, but one of the things that you do lose out on is the chance to participate in sports and extracurricular activities, which is what Ava was talking about earlier. But by far the worst event that could happen as a result of working too long is a loss of sleep, which which could provide a lot of unintended consequences, such as difficulty focusing, and even worse for students who actually drive to school, then we all know a lot of bad things can happen if a student would go behind the wheel after a bad night's sleep. Okay, so now on to my survey. In January, I, I sent out a, a survey to all the students at Booton High School, and I, I got a total of 94 responses, and the survey was quite simple. Basically, all they had to do was just list their grade level and whether or not they had a job for part one, and then they had to list what their GPA was before and after working in part two, as well as any skills that they learned after getting a job. So right over here, we have a graph showing some of the skills 
that many uh, teenagers uh, reported learning after getting a job. As you can see, we have 42 people report reporting communication, 35 for money management, and down from there. Now, this was actually a part of a predefined list of jobs, but um, the respondents could list any other skills that they learned. And in fact, we actually had one senior who listed training new people and supervising new trainees as one of their skills. All right, so for the next few slides, I'm gonna be getting into a lot of complex statistical information, so try to bear with me as much as possible. So this right here is a graph showing a possible correlation between hours worked and a change in GPA, and we have hours worked and the change in GPA on the X and Y axes, respectively. So the wave of data points over here show each individual response, and the big line that we see across the screen represents our line of best fit. And it's basically used to predict what the change in GPA might be with a given amount of hours worked. So as we can see, starting at from zero to 20, we see a GPA start starting to go up, but then after 20 hours, it starts going down because again, no one can work that long. All right, so now I wanna talk about just in terms of changes in GPA. We have 27% of our sample saying that their GPA went up 60% reporting no change, and 13% saying that their GPA went down. Now this is pretty decent data to work with, but there is more that we can do. And what, what can we do with that? Well, in statistics, there is something that we can do known as a confidence interval, and it's basically used to predict the actual true proportion of students who would report an increase in GPA. So th these are the list of numbers that we would use in calculating the interval, and if we actually plugged all this into the standard confidence interval formula, we would get a little something like this. All right, so as you can see by the green bar, we are 95% confident that the interval from roughly 12% to roughly 41% captures the actual proportion of students who would report a change in GPA, or I'm sorry, an increase in GPA. Now, these may seem like ominous numbers, but there are two things to consider. First of all, there was an overwhelming majority of students who reported no change at all. Also, the proportion of students who reported an increase is twice that of those who reported a decrease. So with that in mind, if we use the same exact formula, but applied it based on the proportion of students who reported a decrease, this is what we would end up getting. So as you can see, we have a slightly lower interval this time around, and based on what you see on the screen, we can guarantee with a pretty high certainty that the actual proportion of students whose GPA would go up is higher than that of those whose GPA would go down. Okay, so that is the last of the statistical information. Thank you for bearing with me on that. So for our limitations that we had, um, in total, I sent out the survey to a total of 600 people and I only got responses from 94 people, which again, isn't so bad, but we're still missing responses from 85% of the school, which could skew our results one way or another. And now when I say that there was a limited choices in GPA for survey, um, I asked them to give a range instead of an actual value because many students might not know what their exact GPA was off the top of their heads, so they would list something like say 4.33 to 4.67 instead of 4.5. And finally, one of the other topics that I wanted to investigate was whether or not working a, as a teenager influences your future wages, but one of the only studies that I actually found was the one from Dr. Kocheva over at North Carolina. And in conclusion, I just wanna go back to where I started earlier. Um, if you don't plan ahead of time and don't understand how you're gonna manage your assignments and all that, working as a teenager will be a very bad experience. But if you actually set time aside to plan out how you're gonna manage your assignments and understand how many hours is too much, then there's no reason why you can't experience some or even all of the benefits that I mentioned earlier. All right, that'll do it, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. You do a great job. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the statistical analysis and the breadth of detail you included in it. I'm curious if in your research you came across this at all, and if not, if you could predict how much the type of job would matter. Can 
consider landscaping versus you know working with an Excel document all day. Uh, if you came across it, let me know. Uh, otherwise, what you would predict those two versus positive and negative. So that unfortunately wasn't something that I investigated during the course of my study. But if I had to make a prediction, I would say jobs that involve like say a lot of the skills that you'll need for college, then that would play a bigger role in something like say landscaping, which doesn't require much experience at all. So good question. I think you did a great job, and as a math teacher, I love the fact that you actually applied what we teach you to your real world situation. Um, what did you find was most surprising um, in your research? So the one thing that I really found interesting was that the that was that the amount of weekly hours could influence, say, the unintended consequences that you might experience. See, when I said that students who work over 20 hours experience a lot of bad changes, I didn't know it was something so severe as say bad decreases in grades and overall poor sleep patterns. So yeah, I, I would say that was the most shocking thing that I uncovered. I mean, I know you. It doesn't look like that you looked at it here, but do you think, Joseph, that whether or not a student chose something such as volunteer work in an area of interest, um, say an interest in animals, working in an animal shelter, or interest in children, would, would have the same impact as actually having a paid job? Well, again, it wouldn't really apply to uh, uh, an increase in salary, which I also talked about, but in terms of like actual real world experiences, then yes, absolutely, volunteering does play a big role in learning some of the many skills. Anyone else? Yeah, so I, you're, you're sort of a, a model for this, right? Since you've had your job and you've had job experience as a high school student, uh, and a lot of students raise their hands, right, that, that are working currently. So what um, advice do you have for them to sort of maintain that sweet spot between being able to work and getting the skills and maintaining their GPA? Well, the first thing I would say was that um, they should take the time to look at their grades and if they're in overall good standing, then yes, I would say that would be a good time to start applying for a job. But then after that, um, you, it would be really good advice for them to start planning how they're gonna manage uh, the remainder of their time. So would it be like towards working on homework assignments or would it just be prioritized towards working? Do you think that it depends, like how much do you think um, the grade level of the person who has the job affects the change in GPA? Because like as a freshman, you're kind of getting used to high school um, and so it can be overwhelming, but as a senior, a lot of times you're taking your easier classes. Um, so do you think that has like a really big impact on the change, increase or decrease in GPA? I think the thing that causes the change in GPA more is the amount of hours that you work. So if you work, say, like 15 hours a week, then that probably would have the higher chance of influencing your change in grade. But again, anything way below or way above that, that might not experience the same benefits. Other questions? Well, I would say in working as a referee, um, the skill that you would obviously learn more of is communicating with others, but just in terms of GPA, um, I feel like that would also c cause an increase because, again, you're working with other people and then it also helps you um, with time management. So, yeah, th that would um, help your grades, I would say. Any other questions for Joseph? Good job, Joe. Um, 
Do you think that having a job in college has the same benefits of having a job in high school? Absolutely, but um, I feel like um, when you're in college, um, the amount of hours that you can work is maybe somewhat higher. I, I would have to do a little more research on that. But yeah, pretty much the whole thing is like, attending a job just when you're in school in general, not just say high school, it, it does yield the same benefits. That was a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much, Jill. So audience, I hope you've been enjoying the presentations. Can we show our uh, seniors a round of applause and some love, please? And at this point, we'll take a short 10 minute break and resume. If you need a bathroom break or stretch break,
Welcome back, everyone. For our last round of presenters to get us started is Zara Mohammed. This dynamic young presenter, her goals include becoming a doctor, and during her free time, she enjoys traveling, drawing, cooking, and reading. She believes that engaging in these activities helps her to de-stress and find joy in everyday life. To inspire and educate us on the effects of healthy habits on productivity, success, and stress is Zara Muhammad. Please give it up for Zara. Hi. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. So I'm going to be speaking on the effects of healthy habits on wellness. And so how many of you think that you are stressed? right now in this moment, how many of you think you're stressed? So I see a few hands going up. I know it's the end of the year, but a lot of us might be feeling stressed because of many factors in our lives, such as, you know, um, school, work, things like that. So a few weeks ago, I got a call from a friend and she said, Zara, I'm so stressed right now. I haven't been productive all day and I don't know what to do. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, I guess you should be productive, right? But she's like, you know, like I can't find the time to do things or, you know, I can't, um, understand how to do things or I just don't want to do it right now so I'm thinking well how can we change that so I decided to study the effects of healthy habits on wellness how meditation diet and healthy eating um, and sleep levels change how one can be productive reduce their stress reduce their stress and become more successful so healthy habits I chose to study meditation diet and sleep meditation specifically guided meditation helps one to improve their anxiety level. This, it can decrease one's physiological stress and it can improve their perception of themselves. This is so important because stress comes from two things. It comes from um, outer factors and it comes from self-reflection. So obviously we're thinking to ourselves, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, and now we're feeling stressed because of the pressure that we put on ourselves to be, per be perfect. So the other thing I was studying was diet. So how does one's diet affect their stress, affect their productivity. So we know that glucose is something that one needs to function. It's the main body sugar. You need it to have energy in your life. So with um, glucose, if you don't have the correct amount, if you have too much or too little of it, you're not gonna be able to function. You're not gonna be able to do your work correctly in life. And that's why by, um, diet is so important. Um, an unhealthy diet is going to decrease your body efficiency and it's not going to allow you to really increase your um, efficiency, your productivity, and you're not gonna get the correct amount of work out. In addition, sleep is something that is so important nowadays. Manar was just talking about, you know, how sleep is something that's so um, like useful in our lives nowadays. Naps are not something that should be taken because, you know, it decreases the amount of sleep that one gets at night. Um, optimal sleep is going to relieve anxiety and stress, and a lack of sleep is going to impair higher levels of reasoning. Basically what this means is a lack of sleep is going to decrease one's productivity. And so what is productivity? I've been talking about it this whole time. What exactly is productivity? It's a measure of how efficient one is in terms of their personal goals. You're going to be more productive when you're more efficient, when you have the correct amount of work you want out. So efficiency is not productivity. Efficiency is just getting work out. Productivity is getting optimal work out that's going to really benefit you yourself personally and it's going to show um, a really nice output of things in your life. Um, the other factor that I'm studying right now is success, which is a measure of how well one is performing in society. Ava just presented on success. Everyone was saying that it's, you know, how well you feel about yourself, your self um, perception and things like that. Success is all of that stuff. And so I'm going to really speak about how success and productivity go hand in hand. The last thing I studied was stress, and as you, some of you guys raised your hands saying you were feeling stressed. It's the feeling of being overwhelmed and unable to cope with mental or emotional pressure. Stress is caused by, as I said before, school, work, external factors, and it's something that inhibits your productivity. It's something that inhibits the amount of work that you get out. So I conducted a survey on Boone High School students asking them about their wellness habits. So what, what's your diet look like? Um, how stressed are you? How productive do you think you are? And questions like this. And 
throughout the study, I, can, I uncovered a few relationships between the wellness factors. So I'm gonna talk about productivity versus the healthy habits of sleep, eating, and meditation. So healthy eating versus productivity level. Um, as you can see on the graph, the, y, the x-axis is the reported productivity level and the y-axis is the number of people that answered. The blue bars report a healthy diet. So the people who answered that yes, I have a healthy diet versus the red bars, which represent an unhealthy diet. As the reported productivity level increases, the number of people reporting that they have a healthy diet also increases. And this can suggest that people who feel more productive also have a healthy diet. Um, healthy diet um, in, induces productivity. A healthy diet really causes one to be more productive. Um, and why, why is this? I talked about the glucose and these sugars giving your body energy. And that's why a healthy diet is really important to um, reach optimal productivity. The next thing I studied was adequate sleep. So Boone High School students were asked their level of sleep from three to four, five to six, seven to eight, or nine plus hours of sleep. And again, the x-axis is reported productivity level and the y-axis is number of people. As the reported productivity level increases to 10, the number of uh, hours of sleep increases from three to four to about seven to eight, five to six or seven to eight hours per night. This also suggests that a higher number of sleep hours per night induces productivity. It's going to increase your productivity and it's going to make you more um, productive and efficient. So when you wake up in the morning after your nine hours of sleep, your eight hours of sleep, you're gonna say, okay, I feel ready for this day. I'm ready to you know, get efficient workout. The last thing is meditation's effects on productivity. So this was one of the biggest parts of my survey. I really wanted to understand what meditation is. And since it's a fairly new thing, if mental health is becoming such a new thing, meditation is also something that's um, not that practiced now, but it, it's becoming more out there. Um, and so I asked Boone High School students their productivity level and whether or not they meditate. And uh, I did not get a lot of responses for this one. So it was very like 50-50. I couldn't understand completely because of the small sample size. So the pro reported productivity level was, uh, as it increased, the number of people that answered that they don't meditate also tended to increase, which contradicted with my data. However, um, looking at this data, I wonder if with a bigger sample size or with more information, if the number of people that meditate would increase. That's something that I would have to research further. Next thing that I studied was stress levels. So the feelings of stress versus productivity level. So on the x-axis is the reported productivity level again, and on the y-axis is the number of people that responded. The blue bars are the number of people that responded, yes, they are stressed. While the red bars represented the number of people that said, no, they are not stressed. And th through these, we can interpret that the productivity level as it increased to 10, the red bars increased stating that the people who stated that they were more productive tended to feel less stressed. And why is this? When we feel stressed, we feel less inclined to do our work. And this is because we're so focused on this idea of, oh, I'm stressed. I can't really get this worked out. I'm, you know, I'm just like overwhelmed. And it's so difficult for us to feel more productive in our lives. However, when we're productive, we don't feel stressed because there's nothing to feel stressed about. It's, you know, it's this feeling of, productivity versus stress, there's a balance. And when you have more productive work that you put out, your stress is going to decrease as well. So success levels, we have productivity versus academic success levels and productivity versus personal success levels. I wanted to separate the two because there are students that feel um, academically productive, but they may go home and not feel productive at all. They may you know, not wanna clean the rooms or they may not want to do um, things outside of school. So. Um, I wanted to separate those two to really give an um, insight into like both categories and see if either one had made more of a significant um, change. So as the, the X bar is again reported productivity level and the Y axis is the personal success level or the academic success level. So on the graph to the left, um, you can see that there is a positive trend between the two. 
as productivity increases, the number of people reporting that they feel successful also increases. This suggests that productivity increases academic success, and the same goes for the personal success. Productivity increases personal success. So in conclusion, healthy habits increase productivity, which increases feelings of success and decreases stress. Um, this is important to know because how can one be productive in their lives? How can us, BHS as a school, be productive, make our students more, feel more productive? This would be to increase our healthy habits. This would be to change the foods that they put out in the schools, to promote sleep in schools, and to you know promote meditation. So the limitations that we ha that I had in my study were there were a few. So there was sampling bias within my survey because um, I only asked Bluton High School students. There weren't many, so I didn't even ask John Hill. So I think there would be a difference if we asked middle school students versus high school students or the high school faculty versus the high school students. So that's one of the factors that was, um, you know, a little bit misleading. The second thing was information bias. So my survey was voluntary, meaning that uh, the, there wasn't any way to really understand um, the authentic authenticity. So people who um, were stating yes, they were stressed, may not have feel stressed or felt stressed or, you know, things like that. So I couldn't really tr uh, trust the responses very much. The last thing was the sample size. So there was a very, very small sample size. I only garnered, I think, about 100 responses for my survey. And if there was a larger sample size, I feel like um, for like my meditation survey, I feel like there would be more responses, more, um, and I would be able to inter interpret that differently than what I have right now. So recommendations for my survey. So what can we do with this information that we have? Now that we know that stress and productivity and success go in hand with these healthy habits, how can BHS use this to change themselves, to change our school system? So one way is, as Manar mentioned before, we're going to change the school diet. So the food that's provided in the schools should change to reflect a healthy diet of more carbs, more balance, rather than unhealthy snack options. Um, the second thing is efficient sleep. So I know it may be difficult to, you know, change the school times, the, the, um, you know, to push back schools or to delay schools, things like that. It may be a little bit more difficult, but I think it's necessary for schools to do that because their students will be able to catch up on more sleep. The last thing is um, meditation. So our school does have a culture of caring class in the school, but it's meditation is not practice or it's not um, really understood well in the class, which is why I think a lot of students don't appreciate it as much. So I think that with our Wellness Wednesdays and things like that, we need to promote more meditation for students and specifically guided meditation, which will help them really see what they want to do and understand like what they feel like they should do in the future. That's it for my presentation. I want to touch on something you just mentioned there at the end because uh, I want real quick. Do you ninth graders take culture of caring in Gateway? Okay, yeah. So uh, they know what you're talking about, right? <laughs> um, and you know, just uh, from hearing, overhearing conversations, it is often a class that is laughed at by the ninth graders um, and and remembered not so fondly by the upperclassmen who have taken it. Just from what I've heard. How do we then? So what do we do about that? So like. Are ninth graders too young for this class to appreciate it, or do we do we need to present it in a different way? Like, how do we fix that core issue that we're seeing? So I was also very apprehensive to meditation for a while. Honestly, I kind of thought it was a time waster. I know, so I'm in Miss Brainer's class, and she loves to you know put on five minute meditations for everyone, and I'm kind of sitting there thinking like, should I sleep? Like, what am I doing for this five minutes? And a few years ago, I read this book called A Neurosurgeon's Guide to um, Mind and Memory by James Doty. Um, that book was about his guide to meditation and how he learned to do guided meditation, and it really changed my outlook on meditation. Basically, he talked about how he went to this lady, and she taught him the methods of guided meditation. Basically, she taught him 
to think about what he envisioned himself doing in the future and to perceive himself doing that. So he, his dream was to become a neurosurgeon. So he really wanted to, you know, get into med school and he didn't have a great family background. So he, you know, um, tried his hardest. He studied as much as he could, but also he practiced this method of meditation that she taught him. He used to sit in front of a candle and stare at it and imagine himself going through the movements of getting into med school, of graduating med school, and of getting his diploma. He used to think of all these things, and they used to help him really um, envision his future. And through doing the motions of those things, he was able to eventually become a neurosurgeon. And reading that book really inspired me to think about guided meditation in a different way. Um, I think for ninth graders, I think it's really important to show them the effects and the benefits rather than just throwing it on them. Um, I know the class kind of says like, you know, just sit there and meditate. And my brother's in that class right now and he goes, well, I just slept the whole time. And I'm thinking, I'm like, well, that's a waste of your hour in the class. So it's like, you should really sit there and understand before you go and take that class. You have to understand what meditation really means. I think one of the questions that I have is that I think not just your presentation, but several of the others that I heard before about sleep and health and wellness and success all had, you know, really good tips. And I often feel, you know, as the adults around or one of the adults is that sometimes the buy-in is very different when the adults are telling you, you need to eat it, do this or sleep or whatever. Do you how do you feel the role of your peers and you influencing each other about meditation or sleeping or eating, you know, is this something that you talk about and do you, what do you feel the role of each other is to help each other? Yeah, so um, I know I've seen, not with meditation or with sleeping per se, but with eating, a few of my brother and his friends and a few other people in our grade go to the gym. And they will talk about their diet all the time. They'll say, you know, I'm cutting out this thing for my diet. I'm cutting out this. I want to gain muscle. And that's such a great thing to be talking about because he doesn't really talk about that with my dad or my mom, per se. But he says, you know, with his friends, he's thinking, oh, like one of these, one of my friends is cutting out carbs in his diet and it's, you know, he's building tone, he's building muscle. And he thinks, oh, well, I want to build muscle. So that's what I should do. So he sees his peers do those things and he thinks, you know, this is something that I need to be practicing in my life. So I think that they have to build a community within themselves that is going to um, practice meditation, practice healthy sleeping. And the school, I know it's like difficult for us to promote that for them. It's, they don't love to listen to the you know, adults and everything. But um, I think as seniors, uh, we have PLC in the, in the school, Peer Leadership Club, which also you know, promotes um, students like getting together and practicing all these things together with the Wellness Wednesdays, PLC used to help out a lot, um, all of those things. So I think that, you know, it's difficult to really impose that on them, but we should try to promote it for them and try to, you know, make it something that they can talk about and can understand properly. Um, great job, Zara. I thought that was really wonderful. And I think it's great that you're kind of looking at a definition of productivity that's almost different than what we're used to, right? We're used to productivity and being A's, but and you're kind of arguing that being productive is being like a well person and being a well-rounded person, et cetera. So I was just wondering if you had any personal takeaways from your research that you're gonna apply to your own life. Yeah, so when I was doing my research, I was really thinking about my own life per se. So specifically for the sleep example, I know my parents have pushed me to sleep at nine o'clock. Since even when I was in high school, they were like, you have to sleep at nine o'clock. Like, you know, you're gonna mess up your sleep schedule. Then when you go to college, you're never gonna sleep. And then, you know, it's gonna be so bad for you. And I used to think, well, nine o'clock, like my whole, like three hours are wasted there. But now I'm thinking, well, I go to sleep at nine o'clock. I wake up at seven o'clock and I'm feeling refreshed. I feel like I'm, getting enough sleep, I'm waking up in the morning for school and I don't feel tired. I feel ready to start my day. So things like that, I think parents um, need to push their children to 
practice these health, healthy habits from a young age. So in my case, like sleeping was something that I never really had a problem with because I was pushed to sleep so early from a young age. So even now, if I sleep at 10 or 11 o'clock, I still get the full amount of sleep that I need. But there's never a day, I don't think in my entire life I've pulled an all-nighter. So it's things like that where it's like, you know, it's something from a young age that you learn and, you know, I'm practicing it now. I know how you mentioned the fact of a diet and wanting to change and need a diet for school. Do you think that will be beneficial to maybe include nutrition facts or the various stuff served at school, like for example, the school lunches, so students can better understand what's in them, and also it will help change the diet, like for example, my liquid and that which I mentioned before, it will help me be able to choose the facts that I need to judge and memorize and things. I'm sorry, what exactly is your question? I just, can you speak a little bit louder? Do you think it will be beneficial to have like nutrition facts in the cafeteria regarding the school served food? Um, I think that's definitely something that, that is beneficial. I know like I'll always read the nutrition facts at the back of the, you know, the cereal boxes or things like that. I think it's something that um, we need to pay attention to. And um, I think it's something that the school should provide, but it's something that may be harmful for a few students. I know like with eating disorders, looking at, you know, nutrition facts and the calories listed might be a little bit, you know, harmful, but I think it would be good for schools to provide that if a student can ask for it and ask what's in the meal instead of, you know, just plastering up on the wall. Hi, Zara. Hi. <laughs> All right, so you know, like, uh, how you mentioned, like, how I, like, fall asleep in class, right? So, yeah, yeah and I like to take, like, naps in between each class. So, mm -hmm. like, how do you, like, to me, just, like, meditation is, is sleep. Like, how do you think meditation differs from actual taking, like, naps? Okay, well, sleeping turns your body off. So when you sleep, you're not really thinking, you're not really processing anything. But meditation is specifically guided meditation, whether it be you listen to a YouTube video that has words, motivational words, or it's you going through motions of you yourself graduating high school, going on to do different things. Those are all ways to engage your brain. Instead of putting yourself to sleep, you're engaging your brain, you're picturing yourself through something, but you're not stressing about the other things that are going on in your life. All right, word. Any other questions? So does it matter necessarily what you're thinking about when you're doing your guided meditation? I know you mentioned um, like kind of envisioning your future success and that kind of stuff. Um, do you think it's equally as successful if I picture, for example, funny cat videos or something, you know, something like that's not really useful but not stressful? Um, I think it matters in the sense of what your output will be, so what the benefits you will get are. So meditation does two things. It's gonna relieve your stress, but it's also going to help you. So with guided meditation, it will help you, you know, build those characteristics for yourself. So those, um, you know, if it's, if it's something as simple as like, you know, be productive today, like understand your goals, you are worthy, things like that. Listening to those over and over again um, creates a mantra in your head and you're gonna really understand that stuff versus watching cat videos and you're probably gonna sing the Nyan Cat song like all, the, all day in your head. So it's like, you know, things like that. Before I take another question, I just want to advise the freshmen that you have, if you are gonna catch the 225 bus, uh, you are welcome to leave. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon. And uh, be sure to catch the rest of the presentations when the recorded version is and posted online. Um, Zara, my question was, because I had a conversation with Ms. Maven about this, was reframing um, productivity 
Um, do you think it would be beneficial for people to view things like seeing their friends or family or getting a good night's sleep as the productive thing that they're doing? So, of course. So, as you guys saw in my graphs, I've showed two graphs. It was academic success and personal success. Personal meaning, you know, anything, like me meeting your friends and family, going out for walks, those are things that are going to promote your productivity also because you're not going to think like, oh, like, I'm, you're not going to stress about all that stuff. Pro productivity can also be just like taking a walk, um, getting a nap, things like that are also productive if they're going to boost your mental health. Thank you so much, Zara. Excellent job. All right. Tyler, if you want to come up, set up. If anyone needs to leave to catch the bus, you're welcome to do so. Thank you for coming. Our next thesis presenter is a member of the soccer and basketball teams at Bruton High School, as well as a player for the Jersey Crew Soccer Club. Tyler Stark aspires to study criminal justice in college and eventually go to law school. He enjoys team activities, spending time with friends and family, and helping others. He now joins us on stage to discuss the importance of mental health in athletes. Tyler Stark, everyone. Obviously, Ms. Bull mentioned I am an athlete, so this topic was very important to me, and I feel like in all the sports I played throughout the years that my physical health has always been more prioritized than my mental health, and I have always been in question of that. So first, what we need to understand is exactly what mental health is. Mental health consists of our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It is the main determinant of handling stress, relating to others, and your decision making. Basically everything that goes on in the brain involves your mental health and it kind of relates to everything that happens throughout your life. Uh, it works in hand with your physical health. And now we need to understand exactly what an athlete is. An athlete is a person who is skilled in an exercise or sport that requires physical strength, agility, or stamina. Now, athletes can range in a variety of different ways. They can range from elderly to even children or casual to professional. And for the sake of my research, I looked more into collegiate and professional athletes just because they are more in the press, in the public, and you could see more look into their lives rather than high school athletes and children. Uh, for my thesis statement, I originally went into this trying to prove that mental health is more important to athletes than their physical health overall, and that was kind of my main approach for this, but as I go on, it's like I have grown to know that they are more 
coinciding with one another. A main issue for athletes having a lot of mental struggles is their extreme expectations placed on them. They are expected to be perfect by their fans and coaches. They want them to have a larger than life attitude and want them to have just be perfect overall on and off the field. Athletes are expected to be tough physically and mentally and to show no emotions. They think it is a competitive advantage to be tough all the time and as it has grown to, throw, to show through research that this is not always the best thing for them. And athletes are always taught to have no weaknesses inside and outside of their sports. Now some of the issues with these expectations are there at, is that they are often unachievable and unrealistic. No one could be perfect. No one could be tough all the time. Everyone has things going on in their life that they struggle with. And when these crazy expectations are placed on people and athletes, it is hard for them to balance out what is actually achievable. Um, sports prioritize physical health over mental health, which is an issue that has been going on for a long time always treating injuries more than actual mental struggles. Athletes are allowed to miss games for physical injuries, but if they're having struggles mentally, they're always looked down upon. And they're also not encouraged to seek help with mental struggles. Um, a lot of sports teams do not have people who are linked that athletes can talk to, and this has also been a struggle for a while. Uh, one athlete who has been in the scene for mental health struggles is Simone Biles. Simone Biles is the most decorated American Olympian gymnast of all time, and while Simone Biles was at the height of her career, she removed herself from the 2021 Tokyo Olympic Games for mental health purposes after almost suffering severe physical injury. What happened with Simone Biles is while she was at practice one time, she experienced something called the twisties, which is when a gymnast is not, when it's when a gymnast can, is performing a flip and they lose track of where they are. And this often occurs when the athlete is not in tune with their mental health and is not focused on the task that they are performing. Um, since this, but Biles has become an advocate for mental health and she has not been afraid to seek assistance with her mental health. Now, unfortunately, someone who did not reach out for their mental struggles was Katie Meyer. Katie Meyer committed suicide on March 1st, 2022. She was a Stanford soccer goalie who had won the NCAA tournament years back. She's had great successes in her life and came across as an outwardly happy person to most people. However, this has not seemingly been the case. She never reached out for any help regarding her mental struggles. And the main difference between her and Simone is her unwillingness to reach out for help. But this is not her fault. She's been unwilling to reach out because of the stigma placed on mental health and athletes and all the issues that have gone to grow with it. Looking at some statistics, 35% of professional and collegiate athletes suffer from some sort of mental illness. Just keep in your mind, just because you are having a mental struggle does not mean you are mentally ill. Everyone has mental struggles, however, everyone does not have mental illnesses. And out of these 35%, only 10% of these athletes seek some kind of care. This is an alarmingly low number just because of how many people do experience mental health struggles every single day. And showing that this low number of people reaching out really goes to show how these athletes are not very encouraged to seek out by their coaches, teammates, peers. With these athletes starting to speak out about their mental struggles. Uh, some outlets have been created. This outlet called Talk Space was created by Michael Phelps, who is the most decorated Olympian of all time. And he created this Talk Space app so that athletes and everyone can talk to 
or get in contact with therapy sessions and knowing more about mental health through their cellular device. He made this as a way where people don't have to talk to people that they know or feel more embarrassed like going to a therapist and wanting to reach out for something that they need to be in the like public eye for. So he created this app that you can do just on your phone and it works just to be private with your therapy sessions. Now this is a graph that was created by the Youth Mental Health Center at the University of Melbourne. Basically, this graph shows that an early intervention stage for showing how mental health can impact people relates to the risk of having to treatment, having actual mental illness. So if you are taught that mental health issues do exist and you show that these problems can occur in you very early throughout your life, then it will have a less chance of you having mental illness greater on in your life. Uh, some solutions for the mental health in athletes is having this early intervention, say having a class or having a mandatory speech that coaches have to go over in place with their teams. Some having these education systems in place in your schools and teaching everyone about these mental illnesses will help to break down stigmas and will eventually help to have a greater overall understanding of what mental health is and that everybody needs to prioritize their mental health. And I think having an easy access to outlets through your team, so having your coaches connect you with therapists, having them be able to talk to you whenever they feel best, I feel like it's a very important thing that needs to be addressed. And from what some conclusions that I've drawn from my research is originally when I said I wanted to say that mental health was more important than your physical health, I think it's just important to know that they have to coexist with one another. And by, pr by prioritizing one over the other, it's really not the right way to go about it. And I think that physical health has been the one that has been pr prioritized for years. So we really need to start prioritizing mental health on an equal basis to physical health. And I'll be taking questions at this time. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, questions from the panel? Yeah, so nice job, Tyler. So you are a team sport athlete. Yeah. Um, I, I want you to kind of think about this as a recommendation or a solution as well. I teach technology, and one of the things that I teach my students when I'm talking about lab safety, so using like tools and machines safely, one of our biggest safety rules, I guess, in the classroom is if you're not having a good day, if you're not mentally present, then you don't use the tools and machines, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it, at that point, it becomes unsafe. So I feel like here, too, the example with Simone Biles um, getting the twisties, that put her in a situation where she was actually unsafe. Um, knowing that a team sport requires the participation of everybody, that puts a lot of pressure on athletes to feel like whether they're having a bad day or in a bad mental space or not, they need to, they're, they're part of a team and they're like letting the team down. So there's like a peer pressure component. So my question to you, sorry that was long, <laughs> Um, my question to you is, what are some things that sports can do, like logistically, to alleviate that peer pressure so that athletes don't feel like they have to? So if maybe there's like a backup person or I, I don't know it if you've thought about it that it's way. It's kind of a hard thing to just alleviate it like that because in team sports and whatever, the competitive nature of sports is so high and you're always trying to win and give your ch team the best chance to succeed. So if you were having a struggle mentally most of the time, like you're not going to want to speak up about it because you're want to just you're going to want to just win the game and get over your mental struggle and that's what kind of what has been taught like what I said before like you have to like coaches want you to toughen up and stuff like that, which isn't always the best for you mentally, but you know, 
no one's going to even play the best when they are having mental struggles. So it's a really hard thing to balance, but I don't know if it'll ever be like that because of the true competitive nature of the sports. I don't know if it's a fixable issue. I think you did a really nice job. Um, I think my question is very similar, so I'm not sure if you can answer more on it, but I was also thinking, so I played team sports when I was grown up, you're on team sports. Is there anything you think that the students can do to support each other, as opposed to just the coach saying a speech, or what do you think students might be able to do to support each other more? Um, I think just with students alone, if someone does have a mental struggle and they are it has been known that, look, they have to miss a practice or a game because they have to deal with something just to not make fun of them or anything of that nature. Like, everyone goes through mental struggles, so even if you're not missing a game for it and someone else is, like, you don't have to break them down for it. And this, that doesn't make you tougher or weaker. It's just how s different people deal with their stressors, and I feel like by being more accepting of people when they do speak out about their mental health, I think that would be very beneficial. Great job, Tyler. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, I think a lot of what you're talking about is like a culture of high pressure situations for athletes mm -hmm. and that resulting in mental health struggles and, and you know struggling to reach out. So my question is, how do you see that specifically at Boonton High School? Do you think that that would really exist here? And if so, how? and some recommendations to change that specifically? Um, well, I do feel like athletes, sports at Boone High School are very like looked up upon, like they're very into it. I don't, I don't know how to word that properly, but it's a, just a very um, highly, I don't know, high thing to do at Boone, like it's just what it is. But a way to fix that, um, I'm not exactly sure, honestly. It's hard to really, I mean, a lot of it does deal with the competitive nature, but I guess some ways that you could implement it, I mean, just trying to be more aware that mental health happens in everyone. So even if it is someone else dealing with it and not you, just be aware that you can go through the same thing someday and you don't really have to understand it in the moment, but just be accepting of people when they do reach out. Does the audience have uh, any questions? We have time for one, and then we have to go to our last speaker of the afternoon. Okay. So, our last presenter for this afternoon is a senior. Oh, I'm sorry, Tyler. I see that, I'm sorry, Tyler. Our last presenter today is a senior with a personal story of struggle and triumph that has motivated her love of challenge and goal setting. Olivia participates in extracurricular activities such as choir at her local church, peer leadership council, key club, and national honor society. She manages the cross country and track teams. Outside of school, Olivia enjoys drawing, painting, and singing. Through her various experiences, she has become very well-rounded and is excited to attend college for accounting. Her topic, the impact of school on students with physical disabilities. Olivia Oberlin. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Um, yeah, I did, um, I focused my senior thesis on school's impact on students with physical disabilities. So when I say the term physical disability, you probably think of a student in a wheelchair or someone with very visible um, disabilities. But it's really an umbrella term that includes visible and invisible disabilities. As Ms. Paul mentioned, this is very personal to me because I have a physical disability, even though it may not look like it. I have charcot marie tooth disorder, or CMT, which basically affects the nerves in my arms, hands, legs, and feet. And I have a 504 plan, which basically helps me, and I'll get into it a, into it a bit later, but um, 
Mine personally is written by my neurologist and it gives me the opportunity to have more time going from class to class. I am limited running in gym class and um, since my hands can cramp and hurt when I write my notes, um, I'm able to get like notes printed out for me. And I have been through the school system process in elementary school. I had physical therapy once a week and it later lessened in middle school to once a month, but I also received occupational therapy. So my question was, what were high schools doing to help students with physical limitations since I didn't receive the same treatment that I was getting in middle school and elementary school? So as I mentioned, 504 plan, there's 504 plans and IEPs, which are both um, legal documents that allow students to have accommodations, but they differ. 504 plans are strictly more medical. As I mentioned, mine was written by my neurologist. People go to a doctor usually to get their accommodations written out for them. Um, they also last from kindergarten through elementary school, middle school, and high school and college, and they can even um, be allowed in the workforce. But IEPs differ because they're more um, school related. So the school would write you your accommodations that they are able to provide. And these last from kindergarten up to high school. So in addition to the legal documents, there are also laws that have been passed some of them as recently within 20 years. First, the Individuals with Disabilities Act, or IDEA for short, um, basically grants students the right to their accommodations, such as in their 504 plans or IEPs. Next is the No Child Left Behind Act, or NCLB. This one was created in 2001, and it's strictly based on standardized testing. So. They allow students to use their 504 or IEPs while taking a standardized test to lessen the discrimination um, so that they have the same level on taking the standardized test. So for example, a student with an IEP can be granted, um, instead of having four multiple choice um, options, they would have three. So it just evens out the playing field for everyone. and. In a study, um, a school, three schools for the deaf made adequately yearly progress and their students improved by 95% just one year after this law was passed. There's also the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. Um, a lot of schools have to follow the ADA with some exceptions, which I'll get to in a bit, but um, I know New Jersey is very strict with this. Um, in particular, like it basically, um, eliminates any discrimination for students with physical disabilities. So this um, law makes schools have like handicap parking, um, ramp or ground level entrances, things like that. This is a quote from the Individuals with Disabilities Act from US Congress, which basically reiterates that physical disabilities are a natural part of a person's life and most of them cannot be cured. So People with physical disabilities should not um, be discriminated in any way to their rights. With um, these progress, there was also some setbacks. As many of my peers have talked about um, mental illnesses, um, those with physical disabilities are five times more likely to acquire mental illnesses because they're different from everyone else, maybe visibly, maybe not visibly, but they could tend to feel like an outcast because they can't do the same things or they need more accommodations in order to do the same things as their peers. Um, in addition to that, schools may not have enough resources, they may not have the budget that it takes to have the right accommodations for students. And um, there's also security issues. Um, when I was interviewing Mr. Klebitz, he mentioned that he would like to include um, one of those like handicap door like openers, but that um, 
involves like security issues, like how would um, we know how to lock the doors, like if there's just a button that anyone can press and anyone can get into a building that interferes with security. And a study that I read by Patti LaBeouf in 1975, she was a teacher in San Diego who specifically instructed students with very severe physical disabilities and she said that they were excluded from their community. They really felt isolated from everyone else. And because of this, only one in five children with a physical disability um, attended public schools. So my case study was at Boone High School. As I mentioned, I interviewed Mr. Klebitz. And um, I also interviewed the child study team, Ms. Bialik, the school psychologist, and Ms. Renzi, the school social worker. They informed me on what the child study team does because many of you may not be involved with the child study team, so you don't really see what goes on behind closed doors. But Ms. Bialik deals with 57 students that she meets with regularly, some of those having cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, epilepsy, and Down syndrome. And basically, the child study team at Boone High School um, helps students notice when they're struggling academically and gives them the one-on-one -on -one aid or any accommodations that they need in order to succeed. Next, I interviewed Mr. Engelberger. I thought he would be perfect to interview for this um, thesis project because he is the only gym teacher in Boonton High School who's special ed certified. And he teaches the Adapted Physical Education Program class, which is basically a separated gym class with students with severe physical disabilities and they use different equipment so instead of footballs they would use like nerf footballs which are softer and instead of volleyballs they would use beach balls and when they're playing a sport they don't keep score they try to keep a very positive environment and um, they don't draw any attention to a student's physical limitations Boone High School also offers unified sports, which is offered the Special Olympics. As of now, we offer unified track, but I believe next year we are also offering basketball and soccer, which is the same thing, kind of as an adapted physical education program, but in sports. So those students have their own type of sports team that they're able to have like that even playing fields in order to compete this also is a very good opportunity to build connections and to get involved with other schools and other people outside of your own school. In addition, Boone High School has the Teen Advocacy Program, or TAG. Um, this is my favorite part of what um, information was provided to me by these interviews because um, peers such as in Peer Leadership Council or just any student in Boonton High School can volunteer to help with TAG, and they basically go out every Friday night to do special activities. So um, it's all affiliated with Boonton High School, but it takes students out of the classroom and into the real world. So they'll go to the mall, they'll go bowling, they'll just go out to dinner sometimes. But I think this is a really good opportunity for students with physical disabilities. As I mentioned, I interviewed Mr. Klebitz, and many of you may know that Boone High School has an elevator. This is the elevator in Boone High School, and on the right you can see there's um, blue mats in the elevator provided for extra support. And this elevator is used daily, and it's checked yearly. Boone High School also has lifts throughout the building going up to the cafeteria and going down into Jock Hall. There's a lift, as you can see on the left, and in the cafeteria, there's a lift um, on the right. That's the one in the cafeteria. Um, Mr. Klebitz mentioned that those are only used a handful of times since he's been here, but those are also checked yearly with the elevator. So this is just um, some Boone High School analytics to remember when comparing to other schools. The student population is 686, and the um, special services proposed budget for 2022-2023 is $8.4 million. So comparing it to other schools, Montville High School is another local school. I got all of this information off of their website because I wasn't um, able to get one-on-one -on -one interviews like I was with Boonton High School. 
but um, their school is a bit bigger than Bruin, and their student population is 1,079 students, and their budget for 2022 to 2023 school year is 10.8 million. So they still have most of the same facilities that Bruin High School has. They have students who need 504s and IEPs, and they also have a child study team similar to Bruin High School. Um, they even have an adapted physical education program. And as you can see in the picture on the right, um, this was just like on their website, I happened to see that they have um, a lift and that's in their library because their library is like two floors kind of. But um, with the extra money and more staff that they have at their school, they have um, a bunch of like physical therapists and occupational therapists and behaviorists, as you can see in this chart, you probably can't read it, but there's about like three um, of each type of therapist in their school. So that's what they're able to do with a bigger budget and more staff. Then I wanted to look at a private school. So I researched um, DePaul Catholic High School. Um, since this is a private school, they um, rely on students' tuition for their budgets, and students have to pay $14,600 for their tuition. Um, I was looking on their website, and it was really hard for me to find any trace of special services or a child study team, um, but I looked up, like, who has to apply to the ABA, because maybe they didn't have to apply to the ABA, and it turns out that um, Private schools are required to comply to the ABA. However, it does not cover religious schools. So in this picture, they do have a ramp outside the front of their school, but I don't know. I don't think there's much going on inside the school. So some recommendations. Um, as you can see, I compared Boone High School with some other schools, but I would have liked to have got more of a wider range of schools, maybe throughout the country or even global. Um, schools depend on, as I was saying, the budget, whether it's public or private, um, whether it's religious, the size of the school and the amount of staff. So after my research, I can't lie, I was skeptical coming into this because I wasn't personally receiving the same um, treatments or um, the same accommodations as I was in middle school and elementary school. But I came to the conclusion that Boone High School and other schools, but Boone High School in particular, does help students a lot by giving them a wide range of opportunities inside and outside of the classroom to those with physical disabilities. And this creates just a more um, happier and safe environment. If a student knows their school can provide them with the right accommodations, they will go to school feeling confident and safe and even have like um, successful academics. So that is all from my presentation. Thank you for listening and I will take any questions. Thank you, Olivia. Questions from the panel? Nice job, Olivia, and thank you for sharing your story with us um, and your experience. Um, so in addition to the unified sports that are like mm -hmm. forthcoming here at the school, which I think is a great way to uh, encourage students with physical disabilities to come here and sort of promote that, uh, are there other things that in the school here that you think could be added, like things that don't exist now that you think could be added to encourage and promote that same thing? Um, I feel like our school is doing a lot. Um, not that there's no more room for improvement, but I really can't think of like any other ways as of right now because we do have, um, as I mentioned, like the unified sports, the adapted physical education program, and um, TAG. And I think that's um, more than I expected, like more than enough. Um, but there could always be more improvements. I just can't think of any right now, but I think our school does a really good job of helping students um, explore more opportunities um, both in and out of the classroom. You did a great job. Thank you. Um, 
as you're looking, I was wondering if while you were researching, thinking about this, as you're looking to go to college, um, have you thought about accommodations at the college level? Uh, yes, I have. Um, I recently, since I started driving, um, I got a like handicap, um, I don't know what it's called, like a placard, yeah, a sticker, yeah. <laughs> so I put all my things, so um, I'm attending Drew University and um, I know that they have like those like handicap, like um, accessibility things, but um, I haven't looked too much into their own personal school of accessibility, but um, I, my 504 plan will like carry through to college. So I will just like plan on just talking to my like counselor about that stuff and like my needed accommodations to feel comfortable. Does the audience have any questions? Ms. Basile? I don't think she can hear you. I can hear you. Hi, great job, honey. Thank you. I was surprised to hear that there was only one special ed teacher, a gym teacher, correct me mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, at the high school. So um, I know we all need, we always need extra pair of hands. I teach the little ones. But in any event, mm -hmm. is there a paraprofessional or an aide or a helper in that gym class? Um, well, I'm not in the adaptive physical education program, right. but there is um, a helper in that class. We do have like other aides that help students one-on-one. -on -one. Great. Ms. Basile, any other questions from the audience? Right, great job, Olivia. Thank you. And that brings us to the conclusion of our Gateway Senior Thesis presentations. I hope all of you enjoyed it. Before we dismiss you, I just want to say thank you to all the seniors for a fabulous job for all of your hard work, mentors, for all of the hours you've put in helping our students. And uh, before we dismiss you, I'd like to hand the mic over to Mr. Castano to give us closing comments and remarks. Mr. Castano. Thank you. Okay, so first off, my Gateway Academy seniors Congratulations, you did a great job. Really nice job today. You should be very proud of yourselves and you are this much closer to graduating with Gateway Honors, so that's, that's awesome. Congratulations to all of you. Um, I'm not gonna speak for very long because there is now a bright light in my eyes as well. No, it's fine. Um, no, because they did a great job and there's really nothing more to say. I just wanna take some time to thank a few people on the back of our program is um, everybody who we do wanna thank, but a special thank you to Mr. Klebitz, our building principal, who's been with us today for supporting the program and for, for being with us and for you know making sure everything was running smoothly. We really appreciate that. For everybody who sat on our panel and took the time, for our friends from Lincoln Park, um, a special thank you to the two gentlemen here who are helping with our audio and with our video today. We appreciate that. Our students who helped out with lights throughout the day. Um, you always forget somebody when you say thank yous, but that's, uh, that's why I, we type them all up on the back of the programs. Um, but I do want to call up our two mentors real quick, Ms. Cornell and Mr. Hancock, because our students have a little something for you that they would like to present. So if you could come up to the podium. <clears throat> they have a little something for the two of you. And then we would also like to recognize and acknowledge our gateway coordinator, Ms. Napur Ball. So you guys can come up. Ms. Ball, you can come up. And we just want to give you a little token of our, our thanks and appreciation for making today the truly amazing and special day and the truly amazing year that it is. And it has been. Thank you, guys. I'm so sorry. I told you, no, stay here. Stay here. What are you doing? <laughs> now it's all, it's all making sense. sense. Right. So actually, the three of you, can we get a quick picture of the three of them real quick with all their
And that is truly the end of the program. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to all those who tuned in via live stream. And again, seniors, congratulations.